fun. We welcome you. We have refreshments. Um, there is uh, beer and wine. We're not a beer and wine kind of entity, but Barbara had the bit earlier. So uh, the uh, charge, and don't tell, tell me the charge again, sir, for the alcohol. Sir, what's the charge for the alcohol? Oh, uh, five dollars for the beer, five dollars for the wine, and dollars for the soda and water. Okay, so keep that in mind. We also have um, our guest of honor has been so kind to bring uh, some other kinds of refreshment. And we also have our, what we've been doing monthly, we've got some homemade ice cream here that uh, people have found to be very enjoyable. And uh, that comes with charge, <laughs> given the amount of money it takes to make it. So $2 a scoop and $5 for all you can eat. So uh, the flavors, uh, today I have a maracuja, which is passion fruit, and uh, guava. So we've got uh, two different summertime homemade ice cream flavors. I hope you enjoy them. Like I said, $2 a scoop and $5 for all you can eat. So uh, we're, we're, we're a group of people, and I should say that there are people in this room who have been at most of the Black Song movies from the beginning, which was 1992, in March. So, for example, I want to acknowledge my really, really close, good, beloved friend, Alden Kimbrough, who's part of the Kimbrough family that hosted Black Song movies for all these years. <laughs> Alden, thank you again for just being around. Really appreciate it. We want to acknowledge other people in the room who are here and is just, just supporting us. So we, we, we do a style called edutainment. The idea is we want to entertain you, but we also want to put, put down a little knowledge and, and also, number one, we're taking this. We want a lot of audience interaction, and we know that with this particular special topic, We've got some particular special people in the room. So the format, before we get moving any further, there are chair, plenty of chairs over here. Uh, we appreciate it if uh, folks can stay for a while, that you, uh, as, you as we say, that you cut a squat and, uh, and just be here with us. Uh, so I want to say that. But I want to share with you that uh, the format today is that our Guest and I are going to engage in a little bit of a question and answer session. It's going to probably be about a good 40 minutes. And then we're going to have a great set from the Deacon Jones Memorial Blues Band. So, so we're going to have a set of music. But before that, you all have to put up with uh, our guest of honor and I having a dialogue to set this whole thing. Now, as you were walking in, you heard some music. That was music from various recordings in which our subject for today, Deacon Jones, was featured on. And um, it's almost like as soon as I said Deacon Jones, it's supposed to be. That's the whole thing. But anyway, anyway, so we're, 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 you know, we're pretty chilled out here. And we, again, we welcome things like we, we've got um, people who are photographing. We are shooting because, again, this is our gig. And um, so we're going to put this up on the Black Sound Group website. I would ask that if you shoot, okay, uh, we need at least, a, you know, obviously people here are shooting. You shoot a lot of photos. So I would respectfully ask you to send me 12 <laughs> photos. We will give you the photo credit. Okay, but we need record that would appear in the shop. So I hope that's fair. Uh, we're not haters. We want your career to flourish. If you get a great shot here, you win, you win uh, blues, the Blues Magazine Award of the Week. God bless you. We want this to be a support of the music. Our critical position is we want to keep the blues alive. What better way to keep the blues alive than to pay tribute to a great man? So today we're going to 
we're going to look as much as we can in an hour and 50 minutes at the great work of a wonderful, fantastic, talented, memorable, one of a kind, unforgettable guy, Melvin Deacon Jones. And so, the love of his life. But this, this is how we do things, Blacks on Blue Sky. Before we get into this conversation, would you please stand up? We have a very, very special tribute to Deacon Jones and Anna Stovall Hill that she was, you know, she's not aware of. She said, well, I said, we got a surprise. She said, is Cindy bringing a surprise? I said, I'm not telling you. Well, this is for you, Pam. And it reads, honoring Melvin Deacon Jones and Pamela Stovall Hill for many years of fantastic music and beautiful memories. And so black some please. And yeah, this is great. Thank you. 
bit about who King Ken was. Where was he born? How did he live his life as a young man? When did he really decide that he had a calling to this Jewish Well, King was born in Richmond, Indiana. December 12, 1943. And he was the second son of Juanita Jones and Jay Jones, who were very simple people. Um, Deacon's mom actually cleaned. It was hard to make a living in those days, but Deacon's mom did whatever she had to do for her family, and she insisted that her two boys take music lessons. So, Deacon's older brother, Harold Jones, is actually a world famous jazz drummer who played with Sarah Vaughn, Nancy Wilson, um, Natalie Cole, and many, many others. And he's currently touring with um, Tony Bennett and Lady Gaga. So her two sons, ironically enough, both became world famous musicians but in two different genres, in jazz and in blues. Um, so those early music lessons sometimes pay off. <laughs> Deacon always was involved in music lessons, as I said, from a young boy. And he was always in the band class, etc. They formed a band called the Vets in Richmond, Indiana. The lead singer of the Vets was a guy named, nicknamed Fabian Hewitt who was, if you can picture this, a 350-pound singer. He was named Baby Huey after the cartoon character, the big fat baby. Yeah, Baby Huey. So he was 350 pounds, he was very unusual, kind of a piercing, but sweet, very, um, really beautiful tone to his voice. But the thing of it was, this boy can dance while he sang. So if you can picture somebody 350 pounds singing and at the same time like doing the splits, he was just like a one of a kind entertainer. So he was wearing double knit pants. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I heard stories about how those pants got split more than once. <laughs> yeah. So baby doing the baby sitting so he's in his very first band. And they recorded for chess. They recorded for one of the Chicago I'm labels. I'm not sure. I think that when Baby Huey died, he was getting ready to record with Curtis Mayfield. Okay. But um, anyway, Deacon went from Baby Huey, who sadly died very, very young. He died that same year that Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, Jim Morrison, and Baby Huey, whose real name was Jamie. All of them, their first name started with J. All of them died that same year. That was 1970. And all of them died at the age of 27. It's kind of like a macabre club. Macabre club. <laughs> so Deacon, after Baby Huey died, Deacon went with Curtis Mayfield and the impression. He was also hired. He was also hired as Curtis Mayfield, A and R guy. Then after Curtis Mayfield, he went to Freddie King. After Freddie King, he went to um, John Lee Hooker and became his band leader for 18 years. So let's talk about that. What, what kind of conversations did very eloquent and um, humorous fashion. So yeah, I have a lot of John Lee Hooker stories. And you know the funny thing about John Lee Hooker, he was like a genius, but he couldn't read or write. Now intelligence and literacy are of course two different things, but he was of 20,000 people and like literally hold them in the palm of his hand. He was just extremely magnetic. He focused your attention. You, could not, you couldn't turn your eyes away from him. And that deep, raspy voice, he was just one of a kind. And he was as interesting an individual as he was 
Let's listen to a little bit more Deacon in, in JLH. John Mayhood. Okay. <laughs> People don't care. Speaking on the organ. Thank you. Um, 
And I, I just think that, again, those of us, actually everyone in the room, since we're all uh, very, very much tied to the students, we do realize this connection between the religious music and the blues. I mean, you know, you, 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 you referenced that. I mean, uh, you know, Sun House, I'm going to give me some religion. I'm going to join the Baptist church. I'm going to be a Baptist preacher so I don't have to work. So there is this strong issue that religious people said, boy, if you go into the clubs, we're through with you. The juke joint. When you go into the juke joints, you have crossed that line and you are a sinner. The devil's hideaway. The devil's hideaway. So here we have a man called Deacon Jones playing this music, and he's actually the deacon of the blues. That's very true. Well, let's start church. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But Deacon did have, he always wanted to play organ in church. He, he just, he had a strong religious, a love of religion in his heart that came from early childhood and never left him. So some, what are some of the experiences that really we can point to as the mature Deacon Jones by the world? In other words, had Jimi Hendrix lived past 27, Jimi Hendrix is 71, it's going to sound a certain way. Okay? That's true. So what were some of the things from your experience and knowledge, and let's acknowledge that Pam was at least the co-producer, if not the producer, of, of some of Deacon's recorded material. That's true. The Nile Lotus. Okay. So if you, yeah, that's Pam's, that's Pam's gig. If you, if you get any of uh, Deacon's stuff uh, during this period of time, there's either a reference to Pam or now Lotus. I even saw one with Dr. Stovall. Yeah, Deacon's family name. Yeah. So, so from your observation, what, how does the mature Deacon Jones from these various gigs of playing, like most professional musicians, what really allows him to have a distinctive voice? God, Deacon, I said this when I first met Deacon, the gods of, of music smiled on him. He, he had an ability, his music wasn't complex by any means, but it was sophisticated and it reached a, a large body of people. That's why we think so. I think Dean was in like 52 countries. When they say that music is a universal language, it really is. You can go to a country and not speak a word of the language, and the audience will love you and will understand. So let's, let's play a little music, hold that thought. Let's talk about Deacon in a broader perspective. So here's here's a song. Hey, Jackie. Now it's Jackie Ryan. Yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna play Deacon Jones to one of his buddies, and Pam's gonna tell us a story about these two characters. This is Deacon Jones and Buddy Miles. <laughs> Thank you. 
I don't know if they understood English or if they cared. They loved music. I mean, they did one show and then they made everyone leave. And a whole other audience came in and paid again. So this set was like, to, uh, they changed the house. He can tell me what it's called. It's called flipping the house or something. But yeah, the blues has gone everywhere. And what was Brazil like? Brazil is fabulous, and so is Argentina. And my friend Sergio and Lisandro also. Um, Sergio is our friend from Argentina, and he's wearing the Deacon Jones shirt with Pablo. Come on up, Sergio. Come on up, Sergio. We just want to show. We just want to show the T-shirt. Yeah, so these gentlemen have a Facebook site and they help promote what we're doing today. No, we want you we want you to show them the t shirt. And when you're done wearing your t shirt, would you please put in a glass and yeah. Put it in a frame because that's going to be worth something. Okay. So, oh, anyway. I'm going to it's okay. Okay, anyway, moving right along. Okay, so tell us, tell us about Sergio. Sergio, you want to tell us about Sergio? 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 Is Papo and Deacon. Oh, God. I don't think about that. Okay, hold on. Papo was the number one musician in Argentina. We met him by a fluke, and that's a whole thing. It'll take another hour to tell you that stuff. But Papo took to um, Argentina. We was there like five tours. Yeah. We went every year. At any rate, uh, we played in Diggles and Let's Stop Your Speaking. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Thank you, sir. Okay, so, so just moving right along. Um, you know, there's this whole issue of, because the music's international, People connect with different kinds of aspects of the blues. Thanks a lot. It's great. Thank you. Sir. People all over the world connect with different aspects of the blues. I mean, I'll give you an example. Um, years ago, when the music was really confined to the Delta, okay, or even in the blues revival of the 60s, guys who come from Clarksdale, Mississippi, or some other aspect of the Delta and be gone for a month, come back home, and their neighbor said, well, where are you living? We really said, well, I went, to, I went to Norway, I went to England, I went to Germany. And when he finished the story, his neighbors would say, oh, man, you're fine. You come just down the way over the hills, down yeah. the hollow. <laughs> That's very true. But, you know, the blues is like a TV to you world. Well, uh, tell us about it. Tell, tell us about you. your ticket with Deacon to the rest of the world. Through, well, the, through the blues. It's just such a wonderful way to see the world. It's wonderful for the fans. The fans love it. But it's wonderful for the musicians and for me to be able to travel to these really wonderful places. Switzerland, France, Germany. I mean, and repeatedly because Deacon was very popular. The audience is such a moment. So we were able to, to return over and over again. It was really, really great. Because how else would I have got to? Well, you're Pam. Pam got there. Deacon. So um, you, you, you've heard the message. Um, anybody got any questions? And always remember that we'll entertain any questions. Did Deacon play in any African countries? Sadly, no, but we always wanted to. We almost did a promoter, our promoter in France, 
was trying very hard to look this up for an African um, sure. tour, but it didn't come together. And we always wanted to know. Were there large African audiences in places like France and Germany? No. I mean, not the audiences were not. I think it might partly be because those venues in France are very expensive. And a lot of the people that I saw in France from Africa were working jobs where they might not have been able to afford them. There's a hand up over here. Hi, Ben. So, um, tell us about your time in Detail and Down the Book. Well, my time with Deacon and John Lillard, that's when I first got with Deacon. And I remember when I first went on tour with them, first of all, they were mad. They did not want the girls on the tour bus. But, so I had to train them. <laughs> <laughs> so what I did, okay, they wouldn't let me sit with Deacon because they, as they remarked, we, wanna, we don't want to see no kissing and hugging. So fine. So I'd be in between the guitar player and the horn player. But what I found out. Would I they be trying to kiss a number? What I found out was what it's like to be in a band. I mean, anybody who's not ever been in a band doesn't really know what it's like. But my analogy is this a band is like a human body. There's a head, there's two arms, there's two legs, there's a torso. We all eat at the same time, we all sleep at the same time, we get up and go to the venue at the same time. It becomes second nature, and you think in terms not of the individual, but of the body of the band. It's a very interesting phenomenon, and it's different from anything that I can compare it to. And it's very satisfying. I found it, I really found myself touring. That's what I was made to do. I just like it, and I'm good at it. So did you have a job on tour? Yes. I was in training, and I became a tour manager. Okay. And you also, as I said earlier, you you work in the production side of things? Yes. Tell us about your work in producing some of the material that's, that's now available on iTunes or other resources on the internet. So tell us about your production. Well, we wrote a song together called If Blues Was Money, huh? I'd Be a Millionaire. Great song. And um, I want to ask one question. So I have co writer credit on that. As far as the production goes, basically. Didn't you do Jones and the Blues? Or? I think I got a production credit, but I didn't actually do the production. And this is why. I. When I came up, there were boards, you know, there'd be a master board, mm -hmm. but when it went over to digital, I don't know that, so, no. Another hand over here? Yes, ma'am. Yes, I just want to know what his, his actual um, origin, I mean, his, his ethnic background? Oh, I know. He what was, was he mixed with? He's black. Okay. But, but uh, yeah, I know that. But he has a real universal look, doesn't he? Yeah, that's from accent. Me too. So I was trying to understand accent. I was just saying, what was he mixed with? Well, there was an um, Indian in his family, mm -hmm. and he, if he saw his mom, his mom was so fair skinned, and his relatives. There's a place called Longtown in Indiana, mm -hmm. and it's like um, I almost want to say a colony. And like really fair skin. And it might be called a township. Township. I'm not really actually sure. But yeah, he's black but mixed. Oh okay. yeah. Yeah. So he's just black but Indian. Black Indian. Yeah, but there's also a lot of white in there. That yeah. yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. I forgot to tell you something. You know Mark Twain, the writer of Mark Twain? Uh -huh. But his real name was Samuel Clemens. Okay. And Deacon's family name, his mom's maiden name is Clemens. Okay. And they are related to uh, Mark Twain. Right. Like, like kind of on the other side. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, to this issue, and to this issue of color, I would just, and I say this really respectfully, 
I would just say, look around the room. Exactly. Yeah, look at us. Look yeah. Around the room. We're a rainbow. A, a rainbow. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I just want to know because I'm into everything. I just want to know what you're missing. Where are you from? I'm from Georgia. But I believe. You speak so pretty. I, I'm a mix with Samoan, African, Indian, all that. So I just want to know where you're from. Yeah, very cool. yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. No problem. Um, we're going to play one last cut, and then yeah, we are going to be ready for the band, which means, which means that this will be a moment that she can go get something to eat. I want to eat. Let's just kind of wind this down. First of all, did you hear from Pam? Yeah. 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 Okay, so we're going to uh, we're gonna play this out with uh, Mr. Bad Luck, mm -hmm. you know Norman. And then uh, in in the interim of the music playing, we would like the band to come up, the brothers and the band to come up, Deacon Joe's Memorial Booth like Band, and then they're gonna play the rest of the Black Song Blues time. Now, because because when they start playing, because when they start playing, y'all are gonna get distracted and forget. Yeah, I'm up here talking, so let me finish talking, and uh, they can take you away. Um, we're going to do something I hope that you'll have fun with next time. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you a preview about a month from now. Um, on uh, during the Juneteenth week, I was listening to KUSC radio, not familiar with KUSC is a classical music station. They, they play classical music. In other words, they play European, Western influence music, okay, as opposed to the blues and jazz and such. So that particular time, the DJ was so progressive minded that he played a set, uh, his entire set was devoted to the music of African American composers. And the lead person in the set was William Grant Still. That blew me away. So, what I decided to do is we're going to do something we've never done in the 26 years of Black Sound Blues. And again, those of you who've been here from, from, from Jump Street, such as these two people, you know that we've done things like can't nobody beg like a brother. <laughs> Can't nobody brag like a sister. We've done a tribute to Trayvon Martin. We've done what Obama would be listening to when it comes to music. So we, we've done some interesting stuff. Not to mention, of course, Muddy Waters, John Coltrane, Sarah Vaughn, Gregory Porter, and Diane Meeks. But what we're going to do in August, I'm really excited about it, and I've been studying this, is we, next month, Next month's Black Sound Blues oh, oh, is going yeah, to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excuse us, ladies. Yeah. Okay, what we're going to do. Sure, no problem. What we're going to do next month, I hope you will indulge me with this. We are going to play not the singers. We're not going to play, well, if they're on a CD, but I have a problem with it. But we're not going to play Marion Anderson and Kathy and Ballard. We're going to play uh, Lieutenant Colonel Chevalier, who was in the French Revolution from Martinique, who was also a composer, who was Alexandre Dumas' relative. Okay. We're going to play Coldridge Taylor Ferguson. We're going to, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Samuel, no, not Coldridge Taylor Ferguson. He, he did, uh, uh, he did a great jazz CD with John Furr. Um, Three story that they didn't make it. But the person that, oh, Samuel Taylor Cole. <laughs> we're going to do some Samuel Taylor Colders. And we're going to end it with the brother, the classical composer who did the soundtrack for the movie Get Out. Okay, so we're going to do a whole range of music. 
and we're, we're going to feature William Grant still, particularly because hopefully everybody in this room knows that he spent the bulk of his professional life here in Los Angeles. And if you have not been to it, okay, I would say one of these times, Alden Kimbrough has curated a Nina Simone presentation and maybe some of the other things that you've done there. Lead belly, sun rock. Okay. So Alden has curated stuff at the William Grant Still Art Center at Adams and Westview. So we're going to bring William Grant Still to life. Now I will share with you that it is the composer that we're focusing on and the variety of people who are doing recordings include the Berlin Symphony and, and uh, Symphony Group in the Netherlands and so forth. But we want to really focus on the inspiration of the composer himself. Okay. So keep that in mind, everybody. I hope that you consider this. And it's a little different, but it's part of our history and our heritage. So I wanted to just share that with you. Guys, you ready? Okay, so like I said, why don't you, do y'all do you need two minutes to go grab some food or something? Okay, because now we're at the club. Okay. <laughs> now we're at the club. We want to make sure that you all do what you need to do. Like I said, grab some of this food, this drink, and then we're just going to just jam the rest of you in. Have you had fun so far? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so you all fellowship, and, and uh, I'll be back to introduce you. Okay, give me a couple minutes. Okay, when, when we calm down, I'll introduce you. Okay, guys. Let's play music! Girl! No. I'm saying, like, really, here's one here. Like, I wouldn't even I know.
And now the idiot match who was choosing that, and I knew who was the dragon letters who I wanted to be designed. And she was choosing what Beacon's hat, and I chose his hat, and he was in the movie with it, uh, Rebel on the Road, the last one he did, uh, just coming out, I don't know if it's out already. But uh, I wear this every show in the movie Beacon. So uh, it's the Steven Edge who was on stage when she was on.
So, um, but John Lander, like Pam said, Hook could he just learned how to write his name like seven years prior. His last wife said, "Sign here." You know, oh, here was how you that to GA. That's an L. Seriously, and um, he was illiterate, but he published over six hundred songs. Clearly a genius, you know. And um, so I asked him, you know, how did you when you wrote the song? How did you get him to see your lyrics? Yeah, he, he said, well. Um, when he was in the booth, I just whispered the next line in his ear, and then he sang the song. Like this song was "I Should Have Known." So it was a, "I Should Have Known." So uh, it was a boogie. So, I should have known. Uh, you would have done it wrong. And, and he said, in between every line, "I should have known." I should have known. You would have done it wrong. You know? And John Lander could read the phone book, and it would be it, right? I mean, his he had something. He was so incredible, and it was so natural. But that's how he did it. It was incredible. And uh, Tegan wrote like, I don't know, three or four songs that Hook recorded, maybe a half dozen. But that's how we, you know, that's how we remember the lyrics. He had an uncanny memory, according to Tegan. Yeah. Wow. Truth in the This day in the blues, 50 years ago. OK, so uh, something wrong. So this is a Latin blues. There's all kinds of blues, you know. There's shuffles, and jazzy blues, and you know. So this is a Latin blues. Thank you. 
Mitchell and Nika who are out there. Uh, and of course, the ancient himself, Richard Ross. My name is John, and we're going to do some of the most important. And uh, we'll be out of here. Please be generous, buy some waters, have some beers. No, I'd like to mention one thing. The more you drink, the better we sound. So if I have sound in that cook, you guys aren't doing your job. Okay? And be very generous over there, please. Oh, uh, so, We want we want to keep the music alive, okay? and if we don't do it, we will. So we're going to continue doing these kinds of things as time goes on. It's been 26 great years. This is a really very very special moment, both because this great man is playing, as well as an opportunity to really. Uh, then someone like uh, Pam, who has, who has been a fighter in this field for a while, all the evening. We wanted her to know how much she's appreciated and how much Deacon's members appreciate. And that was the whole purpose of it. You know, it's not to promote anybody, it's, 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 it's not that. And I'm, I'm not part of the blues clique anymore. I'm just a black man trying to promote the culture of my people. That's the bottom line. So thank you very much for being here. So we're going to do this song. Um, who, who, who wants to excel? I mean, who want to ask? Who wants to excel? I spoke to you. You know what? So we're going to do this song.
Yeah. 